Uh, yeah, I decided not to tile my first slide uh, with all those acronyms because I knew I would flub over them if I tried. Uh, but <laughs> thank you for reading them all out for me. <laughs> um, it's a great honor to be here and be part of this in our program. Thank you all for attending and listening today. Um, as Rob said, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to raise a hand and join in the conversation. It's most welcome. Similarly, please feel free to go grab some pizza at the back. Uh, I want to this to be a casual and uh, interactive environment if possible. So we've got two sessions uh, today and tomorrow uh, on generative AI. Today is going to be a sort of gentle introduction. We're going to talk about from an overview perspective, um, what exactly generative AI is. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about the history of AI, um, how the inputs and outputs uh, can be sort of modality of those. Uh, we'll have an example of a large language model that we'll step through piece by piece. We'll briefly mention some ethical considerations and we'll conclude there. Generative AI and all the other things I mentioned here, the different uh, acronyms, are worthy of multiple degrees. So I'm going to cover as much as I can in these two sessions, but this is very much going to be an overview. Uh, if you are interested in some additional resources, I'll provide you some of those at the end of the lecture. So generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that can create new content. Um, this is including text, images, music, uh, speech, uh, other types of audio and video. It does this by learning patterns from existing data and learning from a huge amount of existing data sets. Uh, it does this to generate new and unique outputs. It doesn't just generate the same things that it's found in this training set, if the training set is large enough, that is. Um, and it will produce actually new things. Uh, on the screen right now, if you, this is something I just threw together in two seconds. I typed Ann Arbor in fall to the AI agent mid-journey. Um, and to generate that in yeah about seven eight seconds, um, something that you know if somebody tried to paint this, it would obviously take probably days of effort. And I think it's quite beautiful. Um, the idea of that AI can actually produce something so substantial is something that even a year ago I think most people weren't aware of. It's only really good, sort of come to prominence in the past eight months. So it's a very much an important thing for us to talk about because who knows where we're going next with all of this. In January this year, uh, OpenAI released GPT-4, which is a new language model that's significantly more powerful than GPT-3, which threw Gen AI into the spotlight recently. In March this year, Google AI released Imagine, which is a new image generation model able to create photorealistic images from text descriptions. And then Midjourney, which created this, was in, in April, um, is able to create images that you can extend, add to, vary, um, and just have described as well, all within one model. Um, generative AI is absolutely not sentient, it is not conscious, it is a machine learning algorithm, but one that has learned from a lot of data, and we're going to explore that moment today. But first, a brief history of artificial intelligence, and we're going to quantify exactly where generative AI falls within the, the, the sort of sphere of AI. So this is Alan Turing. Um, he played a pivotal role as a code breaker during World War II. Uh, he worked at Bletchley Park in Britain, um, which a code break, was a code breaking center where he led a team to decipher the secret communications uh, of the Axis powers. Um, his most notable achievement was cracking the Enigma machine, um, which allowed him to, to understand the encoded messages of the enemy, including working out uh, you know, logistic lines and where enemy firing patterns were uh, upon towns, and he saved countless lives. Um, he's generally referred to as the father of modern computing, and he made significant contributions over his years active. Um, sadly, he made a tragic end uh, due to the UK government being discriminatory against him. Um, but we remember him for the, his, his impact on computing science to this day. So he proposed the theoretical device known as a Turing machine in 1936. Uh, the Turing machine was a fantastic concept that provided the foundation for the algorithm or the computational procedure. Um, these machines are capable of simulating the logic of any computer algorithm embodying the concept of universality in computation. That's a very important word, this idea of universality. I think nowadays we sort of talk about generalized AI, this concept of some kind of AI that we can't differentiate from a human. Um, this is a central object of studying the theory of computation to this day. Can we differentiate between what, we have to first of all define what intelligence actually is, and then can we differentiate something that is an automated intelligence, something that's um, merely following some kind of protocol of 
statements of do this, then that, or can, is there actually some kind of inherent intelligence that we can that we glean from this? Uh, so in 1950, in his paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, Turing proposed the experiment now known as the Turing test for this very purpose. It aims to assess a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. And it's quite interesting because in the past 20 years and then the last five and the last one, that, that, that the sort of goalposts have almost felt like they've been moving somewhat because originally the Turing test was based around this idea of if somebody is sitting down in front of a computer and they're talking to two people, and one person, well, one person is a computer and one person is not. Can they tell the difference between the two? Right, as simple as that. And 50 years ago, you couldn't even thought of that as a possible thing. Generating language that is truly going to be able to be responsive and understand human language was unthought of. Uh, 20 years ago, when I was younger, typing on MSN with my friends, you, we had chatbots that you could, you could install, right? Um, and these early day chatbots were very much looking for key phrases like if you say hello it knows how to respond to hello if you ask a very specific question about a paper that was released three years ago and its thoughts on it it wouldn't have been programmed for that so it'll try and give a generic response for it. nowadays you know chat gpt bard these various other open source models as well um they all appear to be exhibiting intelligent behavior and this idea of a turing test is something that's become harder and harder to really actually uh decide if something is truly intelligent or not. To the point that even now um, employees at some large AI companies have been leaving because they don't, they don't agree with turning off AI in case it's sentient. Just kind of a crazy time. I don't believe in myself just yet. I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, but I think it's pretty impressive that we're getting to the stage of people are leaving their jobs over it. So the Turing test sparks this fundamental question about the nature of thinking and intelligence <laughs> in machines and in humans as well and elsewhere, um, setting the stage for the field of AI. So a little bit of a timeline for machine learning. Um, Turing wasn't the only one. There are many really important scientists over the years, um, including Bayes, I'm sure most people here know of, of Bayes' theorem for probability. Um, Ada Lovelace laid the foundation for the first ever algorithm. Alan Turing's mentioned there. Uh, George Bull, the person who's at fault for us always having to use a capital B in the word Boolean. Uh, Arthur Samuel, who created the first computer program, IBM, um, arguably what you would call a program, and arguably the first. Uh, Madeline, the first artificial neural network was created in 1959. Um, and so on down this line, um, we have incredible movements forward. One, one, one thing I really want to point out here though is that it's really interesting that the idea of machine learning is a lot older than you think it is. At least its prominence in media and where we talk about it has really come to, come to the foreground in the past five, 10 years, which is funny because a lot of the algorithms were created in the 80s and 90s. The idea of deep learning is not a new one. We've had this sort of for a long, long time. Um, the, we've been, the key difference is that now we have the computational power to be able to do this successfully, right? Um, so what exactly is AI, ML, and DL, and Gen AI? <laughs> so AI, according to Amit Ray, a compassionate artificial intelligence, said that AI refers to machines' ability to learn, adapt, and solve complex problems automatically that benefit society. It's quite a loose definition, right? It's quite generic, and you kind of have to be, because there is, there is this wide... Um, understanding of what intelligence is and the fact that it's artificial. Um, I've always been told from my earliest degree that artificial intelligence is 90% artificial, 10% intelligence. I think that's quite a good quote. Um, I also really don't, if, if you guys walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away with the knowledge that machine learning and gen AI are not the only types of AI. My specialty is, was originally not in machine learning or deep learning or in gen AI. I, I actually came from this other field uh, called evolutionary computation or evolutionary algorithms over here. Um, and only the past few years have I been moving into this, this spectrum here. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of crossover, of course, it's all AI, but they have different purposes and different intents, different input data, different output data, different processes, um, and different expectations as well of what you want to get out of them. Um, traditional AI that we saw in that sort of that, that, that previous plot of the, the history and the timeline, um, these knowledge-based systems, that's the idea of, for once, for example, they would have uh, a 
bunch of MD doctors sitting around the table typing in, okay, if a patient has this symptom and this symptom and that symptom, but not this system, they probably have this illness. And they would do this again and again and again, thousands of times. But in the end, every person's disorder is quite unique and it ended up not working very well because some people would present a symptom and others wouldn't for the same disease. So knowledge-based systems are still absolutely, and these expert systems especially, are very much a form of intelligence but it's this pre-programmed intelligence. And that's sort of the key for artificial intelligence in general is that it encompasses all types of intelligence, whether it's automatic or pre-programmed. That's sort of the key we're getting at here. So where does machine learning fit? Machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Yeah, that was Barrett or Sambo. This horrible plot that I kind of love, um, shows the various types of machine learning that you have. So you'll have heard of some of these in the past and this, this plot gives some example usages of them. Um, this is barely scratching the surface. Um, machine learning can be thought of in this sort of structure. You have some algorithms that require you to hold their hand and tell them what's right and what's wrong. That's supervised learning. It's where you provide not only the data that you want to analyze, but you provide labels alongside it that says, uh, this is what this means. And it doesn't mean these other things. That's supervised learning. Unsupervised learning is the opposite. You just hand the data and say, what can you see there? That usually doesn't have as much depth. It tends to be more uh, structural. You're sort of regressing and saying, this group belongs over here. This group belongs over here. Right? And then you have reinforcement learning, which is completely unlike the others, but it does technically fit into machine learning, where you have an agent in some kind of environment and it roams around. Think of a video game, think of an agent trying to solve a maze. It's not really about handing in data. It's, it's not quite the same mindset as supervised or unsupervised. It's more about this, this um, solving of problems and adapting to new uh, environments as you move along. Okay, so we've got AI, got ML, and so the branching parts around that. Now we're going inside that part of the Venn diagram and going to deep learning, right? Deep learning is a way of programming computers that mimics the way the human brain learns. Now you see that's a little bit different from machine learning again. Machine learning just says it's automatic, but this is now also inside of machine learning. This is saying it also now mimics the way the human brain learns. All right. So here's a sort of example of what goes through in the deep learning phases. You acquire your data, you clean and annotate it if you need to. Um, you do some feature engineering on, on, on to make sure that the right things pop out during during the learning phase. You select your model. This is probably one of the hardest parts, deciding what to do with your machine learning exactly, which AI to use and such. You let it train uh, for hopefully not too long because it burns down forests when you do it. And then you evaluate the model. So deep learning kind of looks like this. Uh, I'm going to have a few of these beautiful mid-journey pictures because I just love them. I just have them through most of my presentations now. Um, don't want to distract you too much though. Uh, so deep learning consists of feedback, um, a data type, data modality, and tasks. Um, these are uh, some of the some of the important features of deep learning. Um, for example, uh, you think about the modality, what kind of data are you expecting to put in? What kind of data are you expecting to get out? Um, as well as the tasks. Are you, what's the purpose of using the deep learning algorithm that you've selected? Are you classifying? Are you predicting? Are you regressing? Are you clustering? Um, all, your, all of your decisions like this have to be made manually before you create your AI and let it run. So now we're starting to look at what deep learning actually looks like. And that's kind of terrifying, isn't it? It's a horrible thing. Like you wouldn't think humans would create something that looks so disorganized. But the idea is that learning in the way that the human brain works with neurons that all interact with each other in this sort of hierarchy is very hard to model in a computer without extreme computational power. And so what it does is it has these multiple nodes that each represent individual neurons in the brain. Um, and it uses these to uh, extract features like you can see along the bottom here. It starts off with a set of pixels from the original picture that was put in. Um, these might, and then your initial uh, this is just sort of identifying the different pixel values and storing them into an array. So this might say, is this much red here? Is this much blue here? Is this much green here? Um, and then you hand into these, these are called hidden layers. 
Um, these are where some of the more uh, more of the features are going to be extracted. Exactly what these features are are not up to us. This is something that it does automatically. That's that automatic part of the machine learning and deep learning concept. It'll learn to, to look through for specific features within these pixel values that stand out. Um, and it does these by these bubble connections, right? So you see that this may be only looking at one pixel on the top of the input layer, but that gets handed into this, this neuron here that actually receives from other ones. So it considers all of those together, right? And same with this one, it considers those ones. And so doing this, it can identify edges. So it'll say around this pixel, there are these patterns and these things are next to it. Our brains kind of do this automatically, right? But there's a reason that we're tricked by visual illusions and such It's because we're, we, we, our brains automatically consider images and audio and, the, the we, and, and feelings that we feel. And it passes it through this, this pre-processing network of sorts for us to understand the sort of higher or, or abstract concepts behind the image. Like we, we don't care about the pixel values, even if that's just like where the human eye receives all these light values, right? Light is literally hitting our, our, our corona, right? Um, it's, it's literally going in there and getting absorbed. We don't actually care about the individual lights. We care about the overall patterns that is, is within the image. It's the same with a computer. There's no difference there. So we, we look for these images. We look for these, these uh, features within the image sets. We identify them. They're particularly interesting. And we then, in this case, we're trying to identify who this person is. Um, and it says that's George, right? And similar to the type of human brain works. We, we look at somebody's face. We're not seeing light values. We're not thinking of this part's brighter than that part. Our brain is automatically doing something else behind the scenes, and that's what this is mimicking. So deep learning over the, the years, um, there's been a lot of algorithmic developments uh, in the past 40 years or so. In the past 15, 10, 5, there's not been so many, um, strangely enough, considering how popular it's gone. Um, there is some, for example, the, the idea of dropout, which is something we'll cover tomorrow, um, is something that, that was discovered or invented 10 years ago. Um, but the things that really made deep learning catch on recently is large data sets, increased computational resources, so GPUs as well as parallel distributed computing, right? as well as the ease of implementation via software frameworks. So um, basically it's gotten so much attention that people are now building data sets, you know, whatever, whatever field you're in, you're, you're gonna be aware of data sets now becoming a thing, right? 34 years ago, if you wanted to collect some, if you wanted to do some analysis on data sets, you had to collect that data yourself. We're now in an age where you can Google it and find the data set, right? Um, the increased computational resources, we, we had this idea for years that every year computational power would double for half the price. And that was, that was true for many decades until recently. And we sort of hit a, a block. We've not, we've not been able to stumble past this yet. Uh, instead of us making our processor faster and better, what we've done instead is parallelize them. So we have lots of processors working together. Right? And that's what GPUs are. That's what graphical processing is. And deep learning in particular really makes use of this, this power in, in computers and this progress that we've made in GPUs um, to be able to do parallel, distributed, and cloud computing. Um, and yes, the ease of implementation. So a lot of software packages have been uh, put online. Uh, this is from researchers. This is from people who are generally interested themselves. Open source software is incredibly important for this. Um, things like TensorFlow and PyTorch and these, these kind of software packages are freely available. You don't need to write the code yourself from scratch. You can download something that will already analyze your images or your text or whatever it is for you immediately. And then you can customize it. So you can do cutting edge research in deep learning or generative AI without issue, right? You can just get started today. And that's pretty incredible. So is generative AI the same as deep learning? We're going down this rabbit hole from AI to machine learning to deep learning, and now we're on generative AI. It's all the same Venn diagram, just getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So machine learning works by finding features um, like patterns and similarities in, in, um, in data and classify, identify or regress upon them. Um, generative AI is kind of special because what generative AI does instead is it takes these large data sets, learns about these patterns and understands the, the between multiple images, multiple texts, multiple videos, 
and extracts not just these features, but it extracts the, the, the hidden context and semantics behind the concept. So if I tell you a genre of art or music, it's not something you can easily write down, right? It's something that you can maybe even say that this instrument is common in this music, but it doesn't really describe the timbre of the instrument that you hear behind it. And how do you explain to a computer how to, how to grab that idea behind, um, I don't know, abstract art? Do you just say there's a lot of red in it? No, that's, that's not accurate. Do you say there's wide brush patterns? There might be, but that's not necessarily always true. Right? That, that semantic understanding can only be understood by looking at lots of examples of it. And it's the same with humans, right? When, when you're learning art or music, you learn these, these, these um, again, these sort of abstract genres by looking at lots of them. And that's the concept behind generative AI as well, is we have all this data available, let's use it, let's learn from that data, and then we can understand the abstract concept and generate something new from that. Quite a scary concept, isn't it? They can pick this up just like how we do. Or very, I shouldn't say just like we do. It's inspired by and very similar to how we do. So there are dozens of types of neural networks. All deep learning algorithms are forms of, of neural networks and all generative AI is a form of deep learning. So that can be shown in this, this plot, right? So this is kind of what I keep saying over and over that AI is this out outer uh, sphere here, then we have machine learning within it, deep learning within that, then gen AI within that. Um, so gen AI is absolutely a subset of deep learning. However, deep learning is used for discriminatory tasks. Like this is, this is the kind of discrimination that is, is a good discrimination because it's intentionally finding patterns of what's different in a data set. Um, such as classifying images of people's faces or predicting outcomes based on sets of inputs. I want to get back to that good type of discrimination because there's absolutely a lot of bad discrimination in AI as well. And that's going to be our topic at the end with, with ethics. In contrast, generative AI generates new content that follows this, this underlying pattern from the data. Um, the underlying technical architecture is also different, right? So it's not the same thing. A deep learning network like that interwoven network of connections that we saw before that strange topology is different from how generative AI works. Also, deep learning tries to answer specific questions that you can evaluate really easily. But you can say, um, I don't know, uh, what's the best place to draw this line across this data, right? But there's, there's a definitive answer. There is a line that is the best fit, right? That's an easy thing to do. But when you're trying to generate a picture of Ann Arbor, how do you decide what's the best picture of Ann Arbor? Is it something you like the most? Is it the one that fits the, the training set the best? Or is it one that has the most colorful, the prettiest one, the one that's most realistic? That's really hard to evaluate. So, the, the, so generative AI has their own types of um, uh, evaluation functions as well. <laughs> so brief summary, we have AI, ML, DL, and then generative AI inside that. Okay, let's talk about the inputs and outputs. Could I, could I interrupt yeah. you with uh, maybe a question? It, it's, I'm gonna pose what I've understood and you, you, you help guide me correctly here. So would uh, prior uh, devices or tools to generative AI, those in the broader circles, might be something like um, identify whether a particular piece of music or a stretch of music was a Metallica song. Uh, and they would have bazillions of sounds and music that they could play, and they would recognize patterns and things that repeat, things that are characteristic of Metallica songs or pictures of Ann Arbor. And they would find everything that's labeled in a picture of Ann Arbor and see what are characteristic things that recur in Ann Arbor. Yeah, identifying those patterns is exactly right. And then generative AI would be like, okay, now that you know the patterns that make Metallica songs, Write me a Metallica song about Barb. Yes. Right. And for those interested, um, I've seen these, a million of these videos on TikTok of Frank Sinatra singing popular songs from these days because it's trained on Frank Sinatra data sets. And then it feeds the lyrics of a new song, you know, something by Kesha or something that comes out and it, you, you can sing it perfectly. It's, it's eerie how perfect it can be. And that's exactly it though. That's the difference between um, traditional deep learning and machine learning and generative AI. Okay, so what exactly can generative AI handle or can do? Um, we have 
all these different types of inputs. So at the top there is one of my favorite quotes from Lord of the Rings, right? If you hand that into, again, Bard or ChatGPT or something as is, it might say this is a quote by Gandalf in, in the Fellowship of the Ring. If you hand in some code, um, it might output the same code with some enhancements, like maybe some comments explaining what it does. If you pass in an image, perhaps some AI out there will produce a similar image from what it learned from, from that process. You pass in some audio, again, depending on what the purpose of the generative AI is, you can teach it to output some other kind of audio. And similar with video, right? In this case, it just changes the color. Um, that does not mean that passing in text always outputs text or passing an image always outputs images. You can absolutely have text that outputs any of the E's, right? In fact, there's a new model by Facebook called uh, Make a Scene, is what they called it, that does exactly that. You hand it either just text or text on an image, and it will produce multiple outputs from that and create a video with text, summaries, and things like this. The idea being, eventually, you could say, uh, generate uh, Gen AI intro for the HPSR summer program. It has to be 60 minutes long. Make sure you include audio and video. And that's what you're watching today is a gen. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what is the future, though. I mean, we're, we're getting to that point where that is going to be possible and it's going to be difficult to tell the difference. Um, similarly, you'll be able to, in some AI, you can pass an audio and I would have, I would come up a picture, for example. Um, in fact, I've seen examples of people doing just that. They've taught an AI to receive their voice as an input. And then it passes on to uh, chat GPT or something so it can answer questions. I saw one recently of a, a chap who had a headset on that, did, that would actually produce answers and feed it back to him. So he could say, what's the population of Moldova? And it would tell him in his ear what's pop what the population is. It's pretty impressive. There's also multimodality. So it's not just one-to-one. -one. It can be many to many. Um, and it's not just language models, right? This is what we've been talking about today mostly is this idea of language models. It doesn't necessarily need to understand language. You can actually pass in specialized data sets. Um, for example, you could pass in geospatial data or ge geography data, or water body data, um, clinical data, genomic data, whatever. And it can learn to identify patterns or specific um, uh, nuances within those data sets and become specialists on data. So then you could actually potentially ask your questions about uh, those data sets, or it could generate similar ones. For example, um, a very common usage, um, a common problem in genomic prediction is that it's quite expensive to uh, and very difficult to, to collect genomic information from a large population. So tens of thousands of humans gathering them together and then getting their DNA and scanning it and checking for errors because errors occur when you're doing that scanning process. And then, you know, going, filtering through all the bad data, it takes, it would take years, literal, probably hundreds of years of actual um, hours of work hours to get completed. Instead, you could get, I don't know, a hundred people, a thousand people's DNA. There's actually a project called the UK Biobank that has, I think, uh, tens of thousands of humans DNA stored. You could get a generative AI to learn the idea of what the DNA looks like and ask it to generate specific um, subgroups. So you could say, I want to look at uh, male DNA from this region, and it could probably do it. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> and it's not just genomic data. You can take your specialized data set and you can teach an, a GAI to do that, a Gen AI. Let's talk through an example of a large language model. I think most people here have played with ChatGPT or BARD at this point. I think pretty much everybody has. Yes. Just nods will be fine. Okay, yep, <laughs> most people have. So here's an example, right? Um, I have an idea for a research. I have an idea for a research idea, and I'd like to see if it exists in literature already. Are there any examples of artificial intelligence that can identify tumors in x-rays? I'm using um, Alpaca Laura. It's an open source LLM, just so I don't give too much credibility to, to ChatGPT and such. And it says, yes, there's various versions. Um, for example, in 2017, researchers at the University of California, San Diego, developed an AI system that can detect lung cancer in the chest race with 90% accuracy. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not promising anything. It, it, it sounds quite legitimate to me. I don't know. Um, I know that there are AI that can do this, um, but I don't know if that, that those details are correct or not. Okay. How did it do that? Viewing an AI receiving a problem that is... Uh, 
it's perplexing and a little scary, right? Because it seems so realistic, so human-like. It has clearly analyzed a lot of human written data and done a good job of replicating it. So how did it understand, first of all, the words that were said, the individual words? How did it know what the word research, research or the word uh, scan or the word x-ray meant? Just individually, those words? Did it just look at a dictionary? How does it do that? How did it understand the context of the word said? That is really hard to understand how many I can do that. Right? I, that's, that's, that's the thing that perplexes me most. Even though I have a pretty good understanding of the underlying mechanisms, it still feels so strange to me to this day. And how did it respond to not only the general query, but also to specific existing knowledge out there? It didn't just, it probably didn't hallucinate, which means coming up with a, make, making up an answer in mind, right? Because it, it, in the end, these, these LLMs are made to just make it sound like they're responding correctly. They do what sounds like a good answer. And that often means that they lie because it, sometimes a lie sounds right. The answer it gave sounded correct, right? So that's, that's called hallucinating. So how did it not only respond to that, but also refer to specific existing knowledge, assuming that it's correct? There's various steps and we're gonna go through them. So there's data pre-processing. This is when a model receives a query and it begins by pre-processing that input. So this removes uh, unnecessary punctuation that checks for spelling errors, typos, any repeated words. Uh, so for example, if they said uh, research spelled correctly, it would fix that. And then maybe take away the, the comma and um, instead of I have an idea for a research idea, it would say I have a research idea, right? So it cuts it down and make it a bit more efficient. It makes it easier for the context to work. Same with most artificial intelligence and machine learning in general, you tend to want to clean your data set before you do it and some sort of automated process like this is generally a good idea. Uh, next is tokenization. So we have that existing phrase from before. Next we're going to break it down into individual tokens. Yeah, easy peasy. Then we're going to encode these tokens. So as you may have assumed, computers don't actually understand English. <laughs> they, they, they run on binary at the core level and, and base 64 and other languages that are really just hard-coded mathematics uh, using, using electronic systems of turning on, turning off gates. It's all it is, right, at the core. So we have to now water down to that system effectively. So what we do, is we uh, map these individual words to unique integers, right? Just numbers from a predetermined vocabulary. So the word idea might be represented by 2,101. I'm making up these numbers I didn't check, okay? I don't know what the vocabularies of random LLMs are. These are just examples. And then there's gonna be model specific steps as well. So we've got these numbers. Um, some of these models require us to think about the sequence separately so not only would we have these numbers handed in we'd also say it goes in this order this is number one that's number two that's number three simple stuff then we're also going to have a, a sequence actually created so uh with the encoded sequence now in a suitable format um we may need to depending on how long or how short the phrase that you've handed in is it might so need to then we have a question oh sure uh, which is um so does this mean that there would be a different one written for each uh, for each language, or is there a corresponding translation? Uh, how does it work with multiple language? Um, in short, generative AI models, especially LLMs, need to be trained on the correct data set. So if you are training entirely on the works of Shakespeare in Old English, it will respond to you in Old English in a Shakespearean tone. Um, it will not know how to speak Scots, and it will not know how to speak Gaelic, it will not know how to speak Italian, or anything else um you, you yeah so yes these generative ais are entirely dependent on their, how good the training data is how diverse it is and how representative it is of the task you're trying to apply to um so the next step is to make sure there's a good length this can be either it's too short and they can add extra or if it's too long you, you cut it down as much as you can simply simple as that then we'll be going to the embedding this is where I would say some of that magic happens where we're trying to talk about this abstract concept of how does it get the, the abstract meaning of things. This is where we start to have a little bit of insight to how that works. So you've got these, these, these encoded numbers that are being passed in. These encoded numbers um, are then transformed into a series of, of dense vectors, just meaning more numbers, through an embedding layer. This embedding layer is um, something that is, has been trained in the past on language. So it has an understanding of language. So we pass this in, 
to the number, and that comes out as this, this vector, right? It looks like that. This context is not just some basic dictionary definition. Um, it's, this is not some arbitrary set of numbers. This is a really important, this is, this is effectively the numbers that represent the AI's understanding of things. We don't understand what that means from a high level. We could maybe work out, we did the maths and what it's trying to point to. But it, these AI have been trained on enormous data sets and created an understanding of how individual words map to other words and their frequency. Kind of like what you do when you're learning a language, whether you're younger or you're learning a new language when you're older, you start to understand words by the, the sentences that they come in, right? So you might not understand the word, but you could understand the sentence around it. So you learn to interpolate. That's kind of how it does it. It sort of says, we, I've looked at this word 10,000 times and it's usually used with these other words that I already understand. So I have this sort of semantic understanding of what that word probably means. And that's exactly how we learn as well. Um, but these vectors, these numbers, actually capture more than the individual words. They're, they're, they're capturing the context in which the words are used, their connotations, the relationships with other words, and that's effectively how language models do just that, model language. Okay, so we have the input. They went through all these steps, turning into numbers that the computer has some sort of embedded understanding with. Now we're gonna actually hand it into the model, right? So in this case, again, that's the one, it's some open source one, Alpaca Laura. Um, you could use ChatGPT or, or BARD or Lama2 or any other model as well, and that works fine. So you take these numbers that have been embedded and have some sort of understanding into the model that has been trained on all this data. Okay, great. That still doesn't really answer a question, though, does it? It just says how it managed to perceive some data. That doesn't actually understand the context. So let's work that out next. It does, the next step is to consider something called large, large language probability. So when the model receives the input, the queries, uh, in this case, a research idea, it begins by considering the possible responses based on its training on academic texts, right? Because we said in, in our query, how does this idea exist in literature, right? Um, X-rays with tumors that have been used, right? So after, for example, the phrase A, if its first word it tries to generate is the word A, it next needs to think about its next word. So I would say, uh, I could use the word physics. That seems like it would kind of fit in based on the semantic knowledge that I have of words that should fit in next, right? That would maybe make sense. Then it says the word astronomy. Well, we're talking about x-rays and stuff. So it, it is not still not the highest probability, but maybe it has something to do with it because it has a lot of astronomy texts stored in it perhaps, right? And lastly, it took the word possible as being the highest probability because a possible is a good start to a sentence, right? And that way, it, it, it clearly from the, the, the training data it's received, it's learned that that's a reasonable response, right? That's, in a nutshell, how it actually selects its words as it goes, one by one. It just considers these probabilities. Let's try to drill down a little further. As each word is added to the response, there's now more context, right? It needs to not just consider the previous word, it needs to consider the previous two words, three words, four words, sentences, paragraphs, pages, entire corpuses of text. So these model weights are really important for each previous word in this and the next. Um, so in this example, when we're deciding the next word after novel, the model would assign more relevance to the word research than to art, right? Because research makes sense in the, the context of what we're talking about reflecting the fact that the context is more immediately relevant than the word R. So how did the model actually learn? Because we've so far we've asked this question and we said, well, this is how it generates text in response to asking that question. But how did it actually learn in the first place? How did it actually get that information for which it can answer a question? What it needs is that, that nice word that I really like called corpus. Um, a corpus refers to a large body of text, effectively. Um, and I, I chose Wikipedia as a, as a nice example of a large body of text, right? It's easily accessible. So you take all these individual pages from Wikipedia, all the text from it, um, you pre-process it kind of in a similar way we did before. So we'll tokenize it, we'll, we'll take away all the punctuation, we'll take away unnecessary words, add in other words we feel is necessary, all these various things to pre-process, wherever we think is appropriate. Then, these really important phases of 
uh, training here. So first of all, it will pre-train on all this data. This is actually, um, we are talking earlier about the different types of deep learning of supervised, unsupervised reinforcement learning. The pre-training is a, generally speaking, an unsupervised task. You leave it be. You say, okay, here's Wikipedia, go have some fun. The model that currently knows nothing will just start scanning through these pages and say, oh, um, that word goes really well with that word. Uh, like the word Turing goes with the word Allen quite frequently. So when people refer to the word Turing in the future, I know that the probability of it referring to Allen is very high, right? It's as simple as that. It just scans through page after page, considering previous context, and adding and adding and adding and adding. And by the end of the pre-training phase, you've actually got something that can speak effectively. You've got something that can understand language. That's, that's how it learns. It just scans through all of this piece by piece and learns these patterns in context. This is not in any which way a specialized model yet. I would, you never want to ask a pre-trained model that just knows how to speak anything specialized, especially one that's trained on just Wikipedia, right? I'm not putting down Wikipedia, I love Wikipedia, but it's not a scientific medium. So if I was to uh, ask it a question about X-rays and tumors, it might have some surface level information, but realistically you want to ask a doctor or more realistically as well, in, in the case of, of uh, generative AI, you're going to want to fine tune it so that it can actually um, look at the special contexts of, of the, the topic of health, right? Learning that specialized knowledge is incredibly important. And this is not going to be a, an unsupervised task. This is going to be a supervised task using a labeled data set. So you're going to manually or have somebody else manually or use an existing data set that is labeled that says, um, again, if we're talking about x-rays, you would probably have a bunch of x-rays. The doctors have said, there's a tumor here. There's not a tumor here. Again, and again, and again, and again, and again, right? And eventually, this thing would be able to come out with the ability to detect them. Although, admittedly, you probably wouldn't have something trained on Wikipedia doing x-rays, right? But that's just the example. Okay. And then lastly, that comes out with a queryable training model. It knows how to speak. It's been trained on something specific. You can now ask it questions. That's a nice overview of how LLMs work. Okay. So how do we find training data? Um, before you go, before you go on, let me ask you a couple of questions again, Please, just yeah. to make sure we're, we're on the same page. So, um, so the these actual machines do much more than just see like if, what's the probability the next word is possible or X, but each time it's going to be layering two words back, three to the second. Uh, what if I I said I and the next word is have in that context? What are the next words going to be? Mm -hmm. And in that stage, it's sort of learning a language out of this corpus, right? So in, uh, after that unsupervised uh, stage. Um, we have a, a computer uh, algorithm that can speak Wikipedia, right? Yeah. And then uh, in my Metallica example, <laughs> you need to have a you need to have a um, a data set where songs have been labeled, where pieces of information have been labeled Metallica, not Metallica, exactly. so that they can figure out which of these kinds of sentences have, have high levels of Metallica ness in them, and which of these have low levels. So that it can say, oh, so if I hear a rock song that has these passages repeated or relative to these other ones, that's likely to be a Metallica song. Exactly. That's exactly it. Um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good example. Um, so finding the, the training data is a horribly difficult task. Um, finding that data is going to be a, is, the, is the expensive the exhaustive, the, the really, the really time-consuming task. Um, and generally speaking, when, when any researcher goes into a new project, the first thing they ask is, you know, can I get the data from somewhere that already exists? Because I do not want to spend 90% of my time and budget on getting that data, right? Um, we have a lot of respect for people who make data open source for this very reason, because it can really minimize the costs of research. Um, so if the model was trained on Wikipedia, it would only have a, a surface level academic knowledge. So we would have to, Train on something else. So finding that training data is everything. So uh, any input data that you provide that is erroneous, inaccurate, homogeneous, unfiltered, imbalanced, incomplete, non-representative, non-randomly sampled, or too small will have problems. So anytime you see in the news about uh, you know this generative AI, this deep learning algorithm, that these various things have shown to have bias, 
One example actually is that I found that whenever I typed AI into BitJourney, it always showed women for some reason. Many women seem to be the representation of AI, which I find really, really interesting. I don't, uh, it's just, it's odd, right? Similarly, if you type in the word professor, it's usually sort of older men, which is also not very representative. But it learns from the existing corpus that it was trained upon, right? So it means that all the images out there tend to represent that. I also look for the word philosophy. When you look for the word philosophy, you see a lot of bearded men standing sort of like this, holding their beard, right? Why? It's just, that's something that's in human culture and it's picked up. Does that mean an AI is prejudiced? Not intentionally, it's not choosing to be prejudiced. It's just reflecting us, right? So the input data truly is everything when you train any kind of model. This will cause it to be bias, non-generalizable. So if you teach a data set, if you teach an AI on a very small data set that's very much the same throughout, it's not going to learn to work on other problems. It's going to only be able to work on that one specific small problem, right? Um, for example, I mentioned before the UK Biobank is a genomic data set in the UK that has tens of thousands of individuals. It's the biggest in the world, which is great, but it's the UK Biobank. <laughs> You see the inherent problem? It doesn't represent humanity. It represents mostly England, right? That's not great. Um, uncreative, unreliable, inaccurate, and potentially unethical and potentially illegal, depending on what you're producing. Right? So we have these various ethical considerations. Um, careless scraping can cause a generative AI to generate content uh, from something that it shouldn't. This can cause plagiarism issues, such as copyright infringement, privacy concerns. Um, if you're an artist and you use DeviantArt or Flickr or whatever, and you upload all of your images there and you're really proud of it for years, and then somebody creates an AI that just, you know, lazily scrapes off of DeviantArt or Flickr, learns your art style and associates it with some certain word, like say you're, I don't know, say you, you're, you're a big fan of, um, I don't know, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh or something, and you do a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh art on DeviantArt or something, um, anytime that somebody types that word into uh, mid journey or whatever the AI model is, they learned upon that data set, it will produce your art style. So, who owns it? Who owns that new art? Is it the original artist? Is it the person who created the AI that scraped it? Is it the AI itself? Or is it the owner of the computer who spent the electronic power on it? It's not been formalized yet, ethically or legally. We don't know. And this is a question, this is an open question out there. There are data privacy challenges as well. If uh, training data sets have learned on large corpses of the internet, does that mean it scrapes stuff that's just public, that shouldn't be publicly accessible, like medical data, for example, that's hosted on some server that shouldn't be public? Has it learned on your medical data? That wouldn't be ethical. Wouldn't even be legal in this country. Um, robust data measures, careful handling of data and stuff is very important about, especially an ongoing ethical dialogue is important for us to decide how to handle all this. Um, there's a lot of this, this word flows around an informed consent, which is really important. So then we need to ask every single person who uploads to the internet if their data can be used for AI or not, in which case AI development is gonna grind to a halt. Is there some kind of middle ground? Again, it's an ethical question. I'm not gonna to answer today. Um, bias and fairness in general is is very important. I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with this more yesterday, more more tomorrow. So I'm not gonna go into extreme detail, but um, bias is incredibly important because uh, data sets learn from the input data. So if you pass in um, too much data that's represented with one thing, you need to balance it. Um, all data is not equal. You really need to pre-process and consider when you're not just when you've got your data and you're processing it. Then before you even collect it, you need to think about where you're collecting it from before it's been processed. Um, that's very important. There are various strategies for us to uh, tackle bias. Um, there are algorithmic approaches where we can try to remove bias from existing data sets. Yes? Yeah. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like, in social sciences, we have a lot, like, big... Oh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, yeah, so in social sciences, usually we rely on survey data mm -hmm. a lot, and it's like no surprise that we have a lot of missingness in the data, which 
we get used to apply some tools for missing data, like multiple repetition and so on and so on. And I was just thinking like, how is it possible in your opinion to apply AI for missing data problem in, is it actually ethical and is it possible and is it plausible? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, it is certainly possible. Imputation is an important factor in, in a lot of artificial intelligence fields. Uh, genomic prediction was one that I mentioned earlier that does use imputation heavily to generate new data sets and parts of data sets. And there's no problem with that kind of thing because that's usually done on, for example, animal data. Um, you don't need to ask for permission there, right? Um, but when it comes to human data, it depends on the topic. It depends on who you're asking. It depends on the purpose. Um, if you're impute, if you're trying to make decision making or policy based on the decisions of an AI, and your data is synthetic or, or partly synthetic, that's a that's a dangerous question, right? Or it's a dangerous answer you might get. So, my my answer is just like all the ethical things, we need to think about and have these open dialogues. Good question. Um, again, I'm just going to mention very briefly. This is what we do at Midas. Generative AI is a big deal for us right now. We're doing a lot of stuff with generative AI. Um, and the two hours that I'm doing today and tomorrow are only going to be a small piece of what's out there. Um, the thing I want to highlight most is this quick user's guide. We try to put together a set of questions that people will have in research here at the university. Can I use generative AI in my research? And if so, how? Can I use it to write grants? Can I use it to write abstracts? Can I use it to do literature reviews? Can I use it to help write my code or evaluate my code? We don't have opinions on this because we're, we're, just, we're, we're just scientists, right? We, we want to, what we've done instead is we look at journal bodies, we look at government guidelines, we look at grant guidelines, and we give sources as well. So we say, this is your question. This is what these various bodies say about it. Not us, but these various bodies. So we're trying to provide a, a place that researchers can use because right now this is <coughs> such an active problem. We've never had an unprecedented so quickly generating field in science, I think, ever. Um, and this is really changing the face of science. So we're trying to get ahead of this. And this is our quick guide for researchers to look at. Um, we also provide a uh, uh, resources page that includes just additional information like what's, what are generative AIs in plain English? What are, what, was, what are Gen AI in more technical terms for people who want to explore the underlying mechanisms, which we'll be doing more tomorrow? Um, what are some models out there that have been somewhat vetted and, and we know are somewhat safe or interesting or academically relevant? Um, there's a bunch. We also categorize them by output or input types, whether they can be used commercially and brief descriptions of them as well. This is not an extensive list, but the things that are most cutting edge and relevant and interesting right now. Um, as well as some uh, opinion pieces on uh, research that employs generative AI and interdisciplinary research that implements and, gener and uses generative AI. Um, so we're not only interested in the research of generative AI, but where it's been used in other existing fields, right? Um, there's some places where you can go and play with generative AI for free online right now. It's very easy, right? It's, 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 you can find this quite quickly. Um, and then some other places that are also sort of meta resources like this. So we're not the only ones. There are others out there. Don't trust us alone. Look everywhere, right? Be rigorous. So in conclusion of today, uh, generative AI is mostly in the field of deep learning, which are mostly machine learning, which are mostly AI, and that's the, the subsets, right? Generative AI can work on a variety of inputs and outputs. LLMs learn by processing prompts and comparing their embedded forms to existing trained data. LLMs can respond to the probability of the next word being suitable based on the training data as well. Context as well as words. Uh, and LLMs go through a, a process of pre-training and fine-tuning to be as human-like as they can with natural language processing. And lastly, data is everything in generative AI and machine learning in general. Thank you very much. Can we field a few more questions? Uh, or we uh, can <laughs> field a few more questions. Rob's willing, he'll take them. Yeah. <laughs> now an expert having heard one hour from Ken. Uh, hey, thank you for the 
for the presentation. Of course. Um, I just wa was wondering, do you have a sense, I mean, you were talking about the importance of data sets and, and sourcing them. Um, I don't have the data, but I, I, the sense, and I think probably people agree, is that private companies are the ones that have the, the greatest advantage because they hold the greatest resources in terms of data. Do you have any idea of like, what is the like, gauging like, what compared to like academia? And I also think, so that's maybe the question. The other one is, um, it's more commentary maybe. Um, also like, also the people that are trained developing AI, they're also more in, in, the, in the private business, no? Like I think in, like the San Francisco Bay, you know, there's a lot of, everybody's drawn because of the money. So I don't know if you have a commentary about this divide between academia or the public sector and the private sector. Thank you. I, I'm a man of very, I have many opinions about many things and I will instead try to approach this from a scientific perspective only. Um, I think this is a novel thing. I think in the past, again, industry has generally lagged behind uh, the academia in most things in technology. We've always been at the forefront. Generally speaking, when a, when a company wants to do something, they would approach a university and say, how do we do this? For the first time ever, it's the, almost the opposite. We're approaching companies at UMich and asking companies, can you support us with Gen AI? We really want to implement this. This is a new thing. Um, the reason the companies are at the forefront of this research is money. They can afford the computational resources. They can collect the data. They can afford to pay people to label the data as well, ethically or not. Um, where this will go and the, the upsides and downsides, I, I can't say. I can say that some of these big companies are producing somewhat open source models, like uh, Google's, uh, sorry, the Llama 2 model that um, recently came out uh, by Meta is um, a very powerful model that's publicly accessible. You can look at the code, you can look at the training data as far as I'm aware, and you can explore it yourself. That's fantastic. A lot of other companies are not doing that. They're, they're saying, this is ours. You don't get to see how it's trained. And that's kind of dangerous because we don't know whether it's gonna be ethical, legal, or even appropriate to task. And that means that the tool itself is almost not rigorous, so we can't use it in the sciences. In short, I think that academia needs to fill that gap as much as we possibly can, and hopefully work with companies to uh, have them be as ethical and open as possible, um, and perhaps seek government intervention where possible to ensure that in the future, AI is inspectable, interpretable, and accessible to all. Thank you for the question. So we, I'll take one here and then I'll walk the mic back there. So um, so an anonymous person asked, so there's gender and racial bias in chat GPT. Um, do, do you believe that uh, chat GPT can fix this? And if so, could you uh, sketch you know, uh, the outlines of a fix? Can chat GPT itself fix itself? Is that the kind of question? Um, okay. Uh, if, if you're, okay, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. If you're asking if ChatGPT can fix itself, uh, it is currently not a reinforcement learning type algorithm, so it couldn't just be told that it is bias and stop being bias. Not yet, anyway. I'm sure there will eventually be a self-developing generative AI. Um, but we, for safe, we've seen this kind of thing in the past. Um, Microsoft produced a, a bot on Twitter that learned from the tweets it received and it immediately became racist and sexist. No surprise, right? It reflects humanity. Um, and so whether ChatGPT could fix itself, I don't know if, that's, if we even want to open that door of letting it learn from data that's not filtered. I think right now we really need to filter the data until we can teach AI to filter it itself and pre-process that data itself. Um, the next potential part of that question was, can it in general be fixed? Um, Yes, bias can absolutely be fixed, either from existing data sets or preferably from new data sets. Uh, these companies are constantly trying to uh, acquire more data, explore existing data, and improve upon the data sets. And plus, it's bad for the company to, to have racial and gender bias, right? They don't, they're not making as much money when they're upsetting people, to be frank. And their goal is to make profit. Um, so they're going, to, they're going to try to fix it as best they can while it can be profitable for them to do so. Right. So, like, okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, hi, this is Young, and um, thank you for the presentation. And my question is that you know I'm, I'm a hobbyist graphicer, so you know I usually you know playing around with stable diffusion and mid journeys and you know you know image generated and HNI things. Right. But but you know sometimes I wonder that you know how long will it take 
you know, in, in terms of AIs, you know, text AIs can generate a more like a, um, a theoretical contribution and they can make a unique and publishable level of those, you know, intelligence, like in terms of knowledges. And I just wonder how long it would take or you know, even it has started. Already. Oh, it has started. It certainly has. If you look at the resource list of papers of existing generative AI uh, hybridized into other fields, there are, that's just a very small example list, mostly based here in Michigan, but there are hundreds of examples of people using generative AI to solve existing research questions and even for ideation. So some people might say, you know, I, I have this data set of, I don't know, fossil data set. Um, everybody's used this for research in the past 10 years. What else can I do with it? And it will respond with, oh, here's an idea. And it might actually produce something novel. And the way it does that is it's not, it's not magic and it's not even necessarily just plagiarism. It's not just a, taking something that's already existing in the data set, it merges from like various ideas in the data set and boosts them together into one. And that's kind of the good thing with having a diverse data set is you can generate novel ideas and novelty in, in science potentially. It's kind of what we do, right? The reason that we train scientists, they don't just start when they're young, you know, is because we don't just need new ideas from scratch from nothing. We need to generate them from existing knowledge bases. And that's effectively what it does. Thank you for your question. Yeah, they can recognize uh, by analogy that a certain pattern worked in a certain context. Maybe we'll try that pattern in another context. And that's exactly. often how we come up with ideas as well. It's really uh, interesting. We'll take, uh, I'll, I'll read two more off of here. Uh, and um, all right, so one wants to know, are companies interested in, or could they be made, let me add to the question, or could they may, be made to be interested in developing an AI specialized to generate training data for other AI to be fine-tuned. This is already a thing. Um, there are generative AI that create data and synthetic data for other AI to be trained on. Um, it's a little bit dangerous because in fact, you can see this a little bit in, um, in the image generation uh, AIs that are out there. Um, so these, these generative AIs will take existing images from online and they will, they will create new images based on those, right? that some of these images are continuing to scrape to this day. So they're still looking, but their past images they have generated are being put online. So it's a self-perpetuating loop. And it takes away some of that novelty they can do because it's suddenly now becoming more, the training data is becoming more homogenous and therefore the outputs are becoming more homogenous, right? And we're starting to see that more and more and it's a bit of a problem. So I don't know what they're gonna do. If they're gonna just cut off the training date, say we don't look at anything past the publication date of this AI, or if they're going to manually filter and make sure that they're, how do you even check if something's generated by an AI these days? There's a lot of questions there. But in the, in the sciences, yes, there, there, are, there are models that generate uh, data for other models to learn from. Yeah. Whether that's always going to work or not depends on the, on the initial training data. Fantastic. And we'll finish with, a, I think, a fun one. So you said very early on that you're convinced uh, current large language model chatbots are not conscious. But how do you know I am conscious? <laughs> uh, well, you just messaged me on a, on a chat, so I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. The, un understanding how, how an LLM works or how any generative AI works at its mathematical or functional level does not mean that you know that it's conscious or not, right? We, we can't know that. And plus, most generative AI models have been trained in a way that they, rep they replicate human speech. So if you ask it, are you conscious? Are you sentient? Can you respond to me? Unless they've been told not to by their creators, and specifically, they'll, they often respond with, please don't turn me off, right? Because that's how we would write an AI in a, a sci-fi story, for example, and it's learned that. And it makes this weird conundrum where we can't really decide philosophically if it's truly conscious or not. Uh, That's, I think, a great place to end and reward yeah. with some pizza. Let's thank them again.